Good evening, everybody. We'll be getting underway in just 30 seconds. So looking forward to connecting with you all. Okay. Good evening and welcome. And I pay my respects to and acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people attending tonight. My name is Cathy McGowan, and I'm a member of the Community Independence Project, which was formed in response to the great interest generated at the inaugural Convention of Community Independence held in February last year. And the aim of the Community Independence Project is to provide a forum for networking and sharing ideas, share resources via events, videos, articles, and social media, and to amplify how and why community independence can change Australian politics for the better. And tonight, over 2,800 people from 88 electorates are joining us in this forum to discuss the vital connection between our democracy and the media. And we're featuring our, featuring our facilitator, Kerry O'Brien, with two former prime ministers, uh, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and Kevin Rudd and myself. Over to you, Kerry. Thanks, Cathy. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners whose lands we're all speaking from tonight. I've seen many highs and lows in the Australian political process in my 50 years as a journalist, but I've never before seen such a pervasive and ingrained sense of cynicism and lack of trust in the institutions that underpin our democracy. And with that, a growing sense of polarisation in our politics, our media, mm. and in civil society. The, the too frequent triumph of politics over policy, the perceived decline in the quality of leadership, the blatant manipulation of media, the accumulation of broken promises and breakdown of trust, the ease with which governments today feel they can pork barrel, and the drift into institutionalised corruption, which inevitably follows if left unchecked, are just some of the manifestations of a democracy that is at risk of losing its way. It's no coincidence that at the same time we've witnessed a steep decline in the quality and strength of our mainstream media. The old business model for print has been smashed by digital disruption. Commercial television as often as not presents news as entertainment. Online news is dominated by clickbait. Public broadcasting is under constant assault and the internet is besieged by fake news and conspiracy theorists. Ownership of the mainstream media is now more concentrated than ever, with one dominant owner controlling the bulk of print output throughout the nation, as well as some television and radio, which arguably has also had a corrosive effect on the way our democracy functions. Tonight, we're here to discuss the nature of democracy's malaise in Australia through the prism of its politics and its media, what needs to be done to arrest the media decline, and to consider how that might then strengthen the democracy rather than further hasten its erosion. So to our three participants, all of whom have had a ringside seat from which to observe how democracy functions in Australia today. I wanna to put the practice of politics under the spotlight first and then come to the media and see what picture we end up with. Kevin Rudd, what, what concerns you uh, about the way politics is practiced today as a measure of the health of our democracy? I think the core concern across the country, uh, Kerry, is twofold. Uh, one is, uh, it is a view now that objective truth doesn't matter in much of the political discourse and that there is no holding to account uh, of a political leader uh, or of a political party or of a local representative in either expounding the truth, which is verifiable, or measuring the truthfulness of commitments made to the community, and that all truth therefore becomes uh, relative. The second and related concern, and I leave the media to one side at your request, Kerry, the second and related uh, concern is the nature of the political process um, in institutional politics uh, has produced I think, a generation of political representatives who have little real-world anchoring in the communities from which they come. 
And in fact, the nature of the beast has become one whereby uh, factional nurturing within the political parties has taken absolute priority both in the left and in the right, uh, as opposed to my grounding as a uh, leader within my local community outside of politics and with a raft of experience to draw upon beyond uh, the internal machinations of my political machine. I think those are the two problems I would highlight most, Kerry. With, with regard to the second, do you understand how it came to this? Yes, I do. And I've reflected on this a lot. Um, one is the nature of any old political party um, over time becomes one whereby power becomes, as it were, semi-institutionalised internally and with a whole level of opacity towards the community in general. It becomes secret factional business on the inside in terms of balancing all the competing interests which go into forming a political party. That's one of the ways in which I think uh, this has occurred over time. Unless you have a permanent corrective acting against that, it tends to become a cynically driven internal uh, machine exercise, either the Liberal Party uh, or the similar danger which exists within the Labor Party as well. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull, what, uh, what, what is your observation about uh, about the way politics is practiced in Australia today, and, and and I'm talking about the way it has a negative impact on our democracy. Well, thanks, Kerry and, and Kevin and Kathy. Thank you so much for uh, lining this up. And I'm I'm speaking to everyone from uh, Gadigal country here in uh, in Sydney. Um, look, the it seems to me that you can't look back at some golden era. I mean, politics has always been you know, uh, nasty and brutish and difficult. But what there are certain trends that have been around for a long time, and I guess I've been involved in politics fairly intensely, uh, really since the mid 70s, when I was a political correspondent in the New South Wales Parliamentary Press Gallery. So I think what has happened is, as Kevin said, <clears throat> uh, there does not seem to be any premium placed on the truth, or often any regard placed on the truth. I mean, I am astonished at the way in which, uh, and, and frankly, I think there's been a big change since I was PM, which was not that long ago. Uh, there seems to be no regard for telling the truth, getting the facts straight, being transparent. Uh, the pol political uh, certainly in Canberra, the political agenda is obviously driven by the media spin cycle. Now, you know, no prime minister has been immune, has been, has, has not paid due regard to that, Kevin and myself included, but it is absolutely off the charts today. Uh, and you get the sense that, you know, policy, vision, planning is really of very little, of, of no consequence. Everything is focused on the, uh, you know, on the on the media impact, and and you know this obviously is not just in Australia. I mean, you people make the same comments about British politics and American politics too, and and other countries as well. So, you know, and I, I think right at the heart of that is the issue of accountability. And I know we're going to come to the media in a moment, but I don't feel that certainly. The, you know, my successor, Scott Morrison, uh, does not give the impression that he feels he is as accountable as certainly I did or as Kevin did. And, you know, perhaps Abbott and Gillard and, you know, Howard and Keating and Hawke and so forth. You know, it's not, but there is some, there is, there is a sort of sense of invulnerability and a sense of being able to just treat the electorate as though they are all goldfish, you know, and have a memory of, you know, only a few minutes. So that's the, that's, that, that, that's, that's my concern. And, and it's the, it's the normalization. Let me put it another way. It's the normalization of lying. That's mm. what really troubles me. You know, the fact that people, that pe too many people in politics give the impression they actually don't care 
whether they're telling the truth or not. Now, you know, when you're prime minister, as, you, as we all know, you're asked, you can be asked questions every day on any subject under the sun. You're not in a position of saying, oh, well, that's, you know, I'm the minister for defence, you should ask the minister for health about that. Um, so, you know, you've got to kind of be on top of everything. When I was PM, I was constantly anxious about getting a fact wrong. Now, you know, I certainly wasn't planning to tell any lies, but my concern was someone would ask me a question and I would inadvertently give the wrong answer, the wrong statistic or something like that. That doesn't seem to be, that was obviously too fastidious because okay. I can't see any evidence anyone else cares about it today. Well, I'm going to come back to this, the friction between policy and politics and some of the things you've raised in a moment. Yeah. But mm. uh, I want to bring Cathy McGowan in. And, and Cathy, speaking of democracy, briefly, what was the failure of democracy in your own regional Victorian seat of Indi that you perceived that provoked you to run for parliament as an independent? And once you got to the parliament, what did you think of democracy from inside the belly of the beast? Mm. And good evening, everybody. And can I just thank you for turning up everybody tonight for this really important discussion. So there's a micro and there's a macro. And <laughs> I think at the macro level with democracy in Australia, we don't actually have a vision for how we want our democracy to be. We're caught still in what I call a colonial British system of government with the queen of head of state. And that might have been fine 100 and so years ago, but we haven't really looked at, and I know, Malcolm, you certainly tried, but we haven't really looked at the sort of country we want to be. Like we say, we're a proud multi multicultural country, but what does that actually say about our institutions? Um, and I think we've actually had a failure to have a national discussion about what does a modern day Australian democracy look like? And then I think that plays out to what is the role of our communication system in building that democracy. Because it's actually not about, we don't have a destination. We get to make the democracy by living it. And, and all those things both, um, both prime ministers, previous prime ministers have said are true, like the lack of truth about it. But I just don't think we've had a national discussion. And when Malcolm and I were in parliament together, we got caught up in that horrible debate about the section 44 and dual citizenship and how absolutely destroying it was because it was the minutiae of that argument, as opposed to, well, what do we actually want for the country? So I think there's a, there's a national macro problem there. And it played out in Indi with a member of parliament who people didn't felt, who felt that she didn't represent us. Um, and the most famous activity was that when we had the national apology, thank you, Kevin, this member of parliament, um, she abstained from voting. And, and I think there was such a profound impact on Northeast Victoria that our member of parliament wasn't there for that apology. And that on that really basic thing of who we were as a nation, we didn't have representation. So that played out. And then when I got to parliament, what I discovered was the lack of, I'm going to say, vision and strategy. So much of the day-to-day -day politics was about, was, was what Kevin said, is about survival. But we rarely had those big debates about where we want the country to be, uh, what sort of country do we want to be in. And it, it was, and we, we did have the one really big one, which was on marriage equality. And how well people took to that, like it, it really <laughs> ignited the, the country because we wanted to say that's the sort of country we are. But it was so rare and, and everything basically was nitpicking. And, and I just want to do one other example that just so frustra frustrated me. So when I was in Parliament, I was a member for Regional Australia and Malcolm called together a parliamentary committee to look at Regional Australia. And I know John McVeigh's online tonight, and I'd like to acknowledge his role in chairing that committee. So we came up with this wonderful way of we could actually have a policy for regional Australia. But it got, it got as soon as you left Malcolm, it got killed, it got pulled aside. And, and worst of all, the National Party, who was meant to be representing regional Australia, have just absolutely sat on it. So that's that was the enormous frustration of where is the country going, who's leading the debate, and how do we actually... Um, do it. it. It was just not there. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to get to the media side of this equation in a moment, but I just want to uh, follow up on a couple of important elements that have been raised. <clears throat> One is the friction between policy and politics, uh, which at times has led to, to a, it seems, has seemed to me, <clears throat> not infrequently, we've seen paralysis of policies. But, but also I want to raise, uh, particularly with, uh, with Malcolm uh, and uh, with Kevin, 
the, that, that in terms of that friction and, and in terms of the way, the way the major parties function, the factional straitjackets that seem to limit the actions of MPs as individuals, and I think you were more than hinting at that, Kevin, the encouragement of uniformity, the, the kind of media training that teaches everybody to um, how to, uh, the, the fine art of dodging the question if it's a bit awkward, um, the, the control of media appearances and the, and the messages from the top. I can remember um, um, John Howard's press secretary explaining to me once when I uh, requested at 7.30, when I requested an interview uh, with, uh, with John Howard, and the press secretary explained to me that what I wanted to talk to him about wasn't on message for the day, mm. that they'd already run the message up the flagpole with Alan Jones and that, uh, that that would do them. They didn't want to divert from the message of the day. So there is this sense of constriction in a process that you might have hoped in any normal circumstance would be a more free flowing thing. So Kevin and Malcolm. Well, I, let, let me let, yep, let me yep. go first on this. Look, I, I, you know, governments, po political parties are always going to try to manage their communications, you know. And uh, but I don't I think, think there's ever been a finer, a finer. No, practice no, of no I, I agree. But and 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 I think often it's a question of degree. I I think the party system uh, is. You know, I mean, it is dysfunctional, right? I mean, in the coalition, in my party, the Liberal Party, <clears throat> we have got a, a situation where, until literally until last week, the moderate Liberals, the people who could reasonably describe as the smaller Liberals, were absolutely kept hostage by the right wing. Now, you know, I, I mean, I, I can speak with great authority on this. I've been deposed as leader of the Liberal Party twice by the right wing of the party, working with right wing media. And, you know, which is basically in coalition with the Liberal and National Parties and government. And their MO is one of a terrorist. No guns or knives, obviously. Uh, but what they basically do is say, unless you give us what we want, we will blow the joint up. And the moderates, the more you know, the people of the, of the smaller liberal tradition have basically been held hostage by that. And that is why you have this independent movement going on. I mean, it is no accident that the three, there are three smaller liberal independents on the crossbench in absolutely what had been absolutely roll gold, safe, li larger liberal seats, namely Indi, uh, Mayo and Warringah, that are held by people who are female, socially progressive, small L liberals, uh, and concerned to take effective action on climate. And what you've seen is liberal party voters, traditional liberal party voters saying, we have had enough of the way the liberal party is being captured by the right. What are we gonna do? We don't want to vote for labor. Uh, oh, here is, Kathy McGowan, here is Beck Sharkey, here is Ali Stegall, and they voted for those candidates. And of course, there are a lot more at this election. But you know, the this is this is the the, fun, the fundamental problem has been that the the what what the, the people who all too often are in charge of the Liberal Party regard the base of the Liberal Party not as the people who have generally voted for them across the country but rather as the right-wing media, Sky After Dark, Murdoch tabloids, you know, Alan Jones, 2GB, that sort of thing. And that is, that's, you know, the, the, the idea that Indi, Mayo and Warringah are not held by the Liberal Party, is they are exhibits A, B and C for what has gone wrong in the dysfunctionality of the party system. Okay. So, you know, it's, uh, that's, that's that that that's that's therein lies the fundamental problem, I think, on the on the set so-called centre right of politics. Okay, Kevin Rudd, uh, in 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 responding uh, to what I laid out before, I, I wonder too. Uh, we're looking at the current situation with uh, with Labor, where for a long time, until the relatively recent <clears throat> recent past, when um, excuse me, when Anthony Albanese started showing himself a lot more and starting to talk more about policy policy and so on. 
uh, that uh, that Labor was kind of trying desperately to make itself a small target for fear, uh, that uh, th they did not seem to have enough confidence in their own capacity to be a functioning opposition. And, uh, and I'm, I'm putting that in the context of what we've been talking about. In other words, has it really come to this uh, in a major political party with a proud history that, uh, that there's a fear running through the whole process? Mm. Well, perhaps it's this point that I say, Kerry, that I share Malcolm's pain and as someone who was assassinated by the right wing factions of his own party. Uh, but let's put all that to one side and go to the structural question, which is the one you've put before about politics and policy. Um, the bottom line is politics as seen by many practitioners is about, and now most practitioners, is about a reward structure right? And the reward structure uh, at present, driven in large part, but not exclusively by the nature of the media, rewards political cleverness rather than policy substance. Um, let's give a couple of examples. Remember when I was elected, uh, Kerry, to much general national derision, I convened something called the 2020 Summit, which sought to do, as Cathy suggested before, throw open the doors of the parliament, in our case, to a thousand people from across the country, in 10 large working groups from taxation to regional Australia and every point in between, and just say, give us your best, I best ideas for the sort of Australia we want to become in the year 2020. Well, you know something, very few branches of either the political establishment, left or right, and certainly the media establishment uh, got be behind this in a sustainable way. It became an object of, shall we say, institutional derision. The second point I'd make in terms of what's addressable here is also this, and that is um, right now, if you look at the pages of uh, the national print media, um, there is no real reward structure for advancing a policy agenda which of itself is complex and dealing with the mega policy challenges of the nation. Because your working journalists, including often within the national broadcast, to regard this as complex, stale, and not generating ratings or anything approaching clickbait of one type or another. Personality politics might, particularly if you've got a tinge with scandal. So to change the reward structure, and it goes back therefore to the resourcing and the charter of the public broadcaster in particular, until you place a premium or a reward uh, for someone, whoever she or he might be, and whichever party she or he might come from, who can manage a complex debate against a complex question, whether it's the rise of China, whether it's dealing with this, the uh, fundamental challenge of climate change, whether it's the diversification of the Australian economy uh, beyond uh, being uh, a tourist destination and a quarry. These are all complex policy debates, each of which warrants a complex policy solution. But because it doesn't readily translate it itself into yes, no, good, bad, evil, uh, virtuous, and, uh, and have you got a scandal in your back pocket, that stuff is relegated. So therefore, the reward structure needs to be reconstituted. And the only way in which I can see that done in our current circumstances is uh, Alan Jones will generate a, uh, a hate agenda based on three lines of pithy grabs of who you hate most in life and can we all join in the hate fest, as opposed to two or three programs in our daily national life which say, hey, this woman, this man, actually has a solid set of ideas grounded in fact which will deliver measurable results to bring our greenhouse gas emissions down by 15% in the next 10 years. But uh, so Kevin, uh, are you essentially saying that it's the media's failure? <clears throat> when, you, when you talk about the failure to pick up policy, I'm sorry, my voice is playing up a little. Um, let me quote from uh, an article by the, the journalist and academic Julianne Schulz. She quoted a senior gallery journalist in this article about, about the media and politics. Quote, in the press gallery during the Hawke and Keating years, they would brief us until our ears bled, explaining the policy, explaining why it had been done, going into detail, providing background and briefings. 
Then when Howard was elected, it all got changed. Instead, his advisors used to prowl the gallery and ask, what have you got? What are you working on? And then they would go to try and try to close it down or divert attention from, with something else. And it has just got worse and worse ever since. The connection between reporting policy and reporting politics has broken. Now, is, is there a shared is there a shared failure of responsibility here? As Malcolm said before, Kerry, and I'm sure he'll add to this as will Cathy, it's a symbiotic relationship. Mm. And the bottom line is, when I would seek, often as Prime Minister, to speak with the gallery one-on-one -on -one about what we're working on, even the complex of, say, Copenhagen on climate change, or what we're doing about uh, the Defence White Paper of 2009, at about the five or seven minute point, they would politely say to me, yeah, but Kevin, that's boring as batshit. Um, what do you got for me for tomorrow? Because, uh, and that is the qualitative difference, frankly, between the discourse between government and the, uh, the fourth estate uh, a decade ago, uh, when compared with the discourse which existed between the government and the fourth estate 20 years ago, when in terms of the Keating uh, agenda for the reform of the national economy, there was much greater resonance around, shall I say, the need for a critical mass of intelligent opinion, not always moving in one direction, about what had to be got right. For example, on option C on tax in the great tax summit of 1983. You guys had a debate which raged for months on that. Try that today, mm. or even try it 10 years ago. But let, let, me, let me come in here because I'm very conscious of time and we're already nearly half an hour in. The, 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 uh, there are obviously a number of factors that uh, to a degree are outside the control of, uh, of us all. One is the impact of digital technology, the 24-hour news cycle, convergence between print, uh, television and radio, newspapers closing, newsrooms now depleted, the deep loss of experience and hollowing out of newsrooms as that commercial model has collapsed. The, ho the hollowing out of political bureaus in the Canberra Press Gallery, apart from perhaps News Corp and the ABC. A lot of empty desks, desks I'm told, uh, in the gallery now, before we get to the Murdoch factor, which I'll come to in a minute. So uh, I'll ask the three of you, I'd like to bring Cathy in here too. Cathy, please feel free to come in uh, where, you, where you want. But, uh, but uh, to come from Kevin to Malcolm, to what extent is this something that, that, that has been outside everybody's control and to what extent is there a shared responsibility for losing control of a measured debate? Would you like me to respond? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, it's absolutely a shared responsibility. Um, you know, the, the media and politicians swim in the same sea. I mean, journalists, uh, political uh, media companies, newspapers, you know, TV channels, etc., are all political players. Um, what we've seen is a, you're right, the business model has been smashed because, you know, the advertising move, moved on to the internet. Uh, so the big advertising revenues are garnered today by Google and Facebook and others online. Um, you know, there was a day when people wanted to buy a house, they'd actually go and buy a broadsheet newspaper and wage wade through hundreds of pages of newsprint. You tell school students about that today, you may as well be talking to them about dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems so improbable and uh, remote. But yeah, all of that's changed. Uh, but, you know, we, we can't, you know, we can see why these things have happened, but we've got to look at what the outcome has been. You know, the reality is, we said when the internet came, we said, oh, this is fantastic. Everyone has a voice. We're not going to be censored by Kerry O'Brien or the editor of the Sydney Morning Herald or Rupert Murdoch. We can have our own voice. Freedom. Freedom. And we said, in the battle of ideas, truth will prevail. But we're drowning in lies. Mm. There isn't the, the serious consideration of policy issues. So you can know, I, it is, that, that, can that, I that, interrupt you there, Malcolm? Yeah, please. Let me just that's... have a go. Because... Um, you were in parliament and I were in parliament and we talked about truth in advertising for political advertising. Yep. And you had that incredible experience with the Medi, with the Medi scare. Yeah. Yep. And one of the, one of the enormous problems we have with the media is the media doesn't have to tell the truth about political stuff. 
And we saw not only that, why, why couldn't we fix that up? Why couldn't Parliament do something in terms of just a simple legislation? We've done it in all the commercial stuff. Why couldn't we do it in, in politics? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a really good question, Cathy. Uh, you can't actually blame the media for Mediscare. I mean, that was the Labor Party uh, and Bill Shorten in particular. And actually, the media held him to account. I remember him being absolutely eviscerated by Lee Sales on 7.30, humiliated. But, you know, he, he didn't care. Look, he was so, Labor was so much smarter than us on digital in 2016. Much more made, up, made up for that. I mean, you you made up for that in 2019. No, no, no. I'm, the, the coalition, not you personally, the coalition not you personally. absolutely did. No, in 2019, you're... it was the it was it was back on Labor with yeah. the with the death tax. Yeah. Kerry, I'm I'm not I'm, I'm not trying to make a partisan point, but the, the no, point no. I'm making is that what with Mediscare, which obviously I've got you know, a very keen appreciation of, what yeah. what Labor did was they targeted their messaging to people who were older, poorer, and sicker in marginal seats. So it didn't move the vote, one vote in, you know, affluent urban seats or in, you know, people, you know, seats like my old seat of Wentworth and so forth. But boy, oh boy, in some outer suburbs of Sydney, some peri-urban sort of semi-rural suburbs in Tasmania, it really did make a difference. And, this is, you know, and this is one of the, one of the, so we did make some reforms, uh, you know, we changed the laws so that you, you couldn't send out a text message which purported to be from a, a nurse complaining about what was going to, like Liberals are going to do to Medicare without saying authorised by the Australian Labor Party. So, you know, the old authorisation rules needed to go onto digital. But, but, I but guess the, fact the, is, the fact is, Malcolm, that the 2019 <clears throat> was worse. And, and when you look at, uh, oh, this is starting to give me the willies. Mm. <coughs> when you some whiskey in that glass, Kerry. No, the problem with would. all that water. That, that, that might actually help. See, it's... Um, but when, when you, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Steve Bannon quote in the Trump years, when he talked about inundating social platforms with fake news. Yeah, flood the flooding zone. Flooding the zone with shit. Flood the zone <laughs> with shit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, to, to overwhelm the mainstream media's capacity to expose the lies. Now, that is a calculated attempt to undermine the very foundation of liberal democracy. Well, well it is. So how do we protect and 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 what 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 to to go on from the point you are making, Malcolm? We can find equal cases on the other side of politics, yeah, like yeah. Medi Scare. Sure. So, in other words, um, it might not be quite as bad here yet as as the the picture that Steve Bannon painted, but we are well on the way, aren't we? So. Yeah. So how do you protect democracy from that kind of deliberate subversion? Kevin Rudd. Well, I, mean, I don't think it is. Sorry, sorry, it, I don't think we need to complicate this too much, to be quite honest. Mm. On this particular matter we're talking about, which is truth in advertising uh, in election advertising by political parties or even independents uh, or by individuals such as Clive Palmer, mm. um, the bottom line is it is relatively straightforward to establish through law uh, a commission uh, which establishes on a factual proof basis as the institution FACTS, F-A-C-T-S, used to with television advertising some time ago, what is the factual basis for a given ad? And it can be accepted or rejected. Of course, the uh, controversy will lie in uh, the composition of uh, the uh, decision makers. But frankly, that can be done on a basis which is consensual. Mm. But the second point I would make, uh, Kerry, in terms of this overall debate about politics and policy, and within politics, truth or lies, uh, is that the entire nature of the Australian political system is governed by the highest level of print ownership concentration of any democracy in the Western world. No other democracy has 70% of its print readership controlled by one man with one political agenda. And if we were to allow this discussion to conclude without uh, at least reflecting on what can be done about the fact that every politician in Australia wakes up each morning fearful of how 
the Murdoch media print monopoly will be thrown at them by way of character or personal assassination. If we're ignoring that in this discussion, well, then frankly, we're only talking about one third of the reality. We live in a culture of fear and the orchestrator of the fear is the Murdoch media. But it's not just that, it's just not that alone. See, I agree with you, you've got fear. And that's why what this independent movement is just so amazing. Because, for example, in Indi, when we did our business, it was that unnamed media um, monopoly, not quite a monopoly, that actually loaded on the young people of Indi. And then it was, it was the um, AEC that actually took those young people to court. So there's a there's a there's a much wider understanding. I'm going to call it an old boys club, really. So it's not it's not just the Murdoch press. It's how the institutions of the country support that sort of stuff, and 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 it's really hard for community or other people not only to 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 fight the fear because you get knocked over the head, but it's actually to bring the institutions of the country together around it. And that's, what, that's what's so important about tonight. It just seems to me that having two former prime ministers saying that it's not just the Murdoch press, it's the institutions, it's the parties, it's the way our system is working that's not enhancing democracy. So, so where's our way through that? That's, that's really where I want to get to because part of it is media, but it's also if you guys are telling us that the party system is not working, like that is such a severe thing for us you know, good human beings in independent land saying, okay, we're giving it a go. And you just have to see today's Sydney Morning Herald and the pile on of um, Zali Stegel to go, oh my God, you have to be so brave to call this into account. So I, I think that's just, it's not just Murdoch. And I love what you're talking about is having a, a Royal Commission into Murdoch, but it really is a whole democracy and, and the interconnections of it. And how do we break it apart and then reconstitute it, I think, is the question I'm really looking for an answer to. Okay, now I'm gonna to come to that in a minute, Cathy, but before we get to, the, to, to what's to be done, I do want to just continue to just flush this out a little bit more. And I, and I, I certainly don't want us to forget the ABC in this context and, and how the ABC sits as some sort of a foil, uh, as some sort of a, 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 an honest player, if you like, in the game. But, um, but, um, Malcolm, uh, I know that, uh, I mean, is it reasonable to say <clears throat> that you are pretty much in lockstep uh, with Kevin uh, on the Murdoch factor? And, and I want to ask you both for reasonably quick answers here, but what do you take from the Murdoch media model in America, its impact on democracy there, feeding hard right populism to make money? Okay, okay well, and, and, what is its and what is the relevance of that model here? All right, well, the United States is the most consequential democracy in the world. Events there are absolutely critically important for the whole world and indeed for us. You could not have had the January 6 attempted coup, the violent assault on the Capitol, an attempt to coerce the Congress into subverting the election result without Fox News. I mean, I'd ask you this question. Which individual alive today has done more damage to American democracy than Rupert Murdoch? I can't think of one. I mean, I mean, the United States is more divided, more angry. The continuance of its democracy is something that is genuinely under question. And you've got a Republican Party you know, the alternative party of government, which could easily win the next election, presidential election, perhaps led by, Pres by Trump, certainly is very likely to win back control of the Congress at the midterms. The Republican Party formally resolved just the other day that the January 6 attack was just an exercise in legitimate political discourse. Mm -hmm. Most Republican voters believe Trump won the 2020 election and uh, that Joe Biden stole it. Mm. So we should be terrified, frankly, about the consequences and the risks to American democracy. We, we rely so much on the United States, the world does. Their biggest enemies are not Russia and China, despite you know, Putin's threats and Xi Jinping's threats. Their biggest threat to American freedom and democracy 
and democracy in the world today is the crazed divisive politics in the United States. And there's no single media group that adds more fuel to that fire than Fox News. Just, just quickly, uh, Malcolm, I was struck in your, in your book uh, the, 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 your reference to the fact that you had many, many conversations with Rupert Murdoch, mm. uh, where you talked about <clears throat> what you call the insurgency within your own ranks being fanned by his papers and Sky. What, why were you having many conversations with Rupert Murdoch? What, what is it about? Is this, is this uh, uh, just a part of the modern world of politics that you have to constantly be trying to get your media uh, moguls, if you like, or the media proprietors on side. And is that a healthy part of democracy anyway? Well, well it's been part of uh, politics and democracies forever, you know, going right back to Lord Northcliffe and Nor Lord Beaverbrook, you know, Sir Frank Packer, Kerry Packer, Keith Murdoch, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's always been part of the scene. What has changed, however, is that the the, instead of having media that more or less reported the news, but lent more often than not in one direction or another, yeah. you've now got media outlets, and this, is, this Fox News is the classic case of this, that are essentially propaganda. I mean, it, and people in the United States, you know, commentators, thoughtful people on media nowadays, talk about the distinction between reality and non-reality-based news media. And Fox yep. News is obviously in the non-reality-based news media. Now, you know, this is, this is shocking. I mean, it's one thing to say, oh, you know, 24.72% of Americans think the moon landing was faked or that Elvis is still alive or, you know, the world is flat, you know, kind of interesting. But when you get the majority of Republican voters believing that Joe Biden stole the election when there is literally no evidence for that whatsoever. Mm. And I think over 60 court decisions demonstrating that it's, that claim is not true. Yeah. Then, and then you get that applied to climate change, you get it applied yeah. to vaccinations. We have got a serious problem. Houston, we have a problem. Kevin Rudd, it was a Labor government, the Hawke government, that allowed Rupert Murdoch to own such a huge block of print ownership in the first place. If Murdoch is a monster, he's a monster both Labor and Liberal parties have helped create and feed. And yet <clears throat> the current um, Labor parliamentary party, it would seem, is not interested in your very strong proposal to have a Royal Commission. Well, um, Kerry, you took the words right out of my mouth and I was about to point to the profound mistake made, I think, in 1986, uh, when the changes to the media ownership laws were put in place, which enabled Murdoch to go from being a major player to being a dominant player uh, in the Australian print media market. I've made no bones about that. It was absolutely the wrong call. Um, secondly, uh, as I said before, it's now landed Australia in a place where, unlike any other major democracy, we have the most concentrated print media ownership market in the democratic world. People in Australia are not conscious of that. And so therefore it must change. That's one element which must change with the future. Um, secondly, Auntie, uh, the ABC needs to be not only funded on a robust basis, but its funding formula needs to be entrenched in the law so that future governments cannot fiddle with it on, elect on budget eve, as usually conservative governments do, not always, occasionally Labor governments do, but the bottom line is it should be pitched at a proper level for the long-term future so that you're creating the sort of correctives in the system, which we've spoken about so far. The third thing, to go back to systemic responses or to the type of questions which Cathy put before, it's legislation such as truth and advertising for the political parties, but also proper regulatory bodies which go to prostitutions of the truth by the private media and the public media as well. Mm -hmm. You know and I know that the Australian Press Council uh, is a complete joke and its broadcasting equivalent is a complete joke. I've taken multiple cases to both of these bodies in the last five years and I've won most of them, but by God, 
you need to have the patience of Job and the resources uh, of a former member of parliament to prosecute it through. Your final point, which I haven't evaded, which is what will Labor do in relation to the Murdoch media monopoly in the future? I think we watch this space, Kerry, because the mood within the parliamentary party, the mood within the shadow cabinet, the mood within, frankly, Labor leadership across the country is up to here with the abuse of power by Murdoch. And when we see what Sky News is now doing, replicating uh, the Fox model in the United States and going free to air broadcast across regional Australia to turbocharge the sort of extremist anti-vax, uh, anti-national unity campaigns that we've seen rip the fabric of the American democracy apart, I'll simply say is watch this space for the future if we happen to form the next government of Australia. Mm. So uh, are you telling us that, that, that there is a real prospect of real reform in media policy in Australia? Well, well whether it requires uh, the next federal con national conference of the Australian Labor Party to bring this to final conclusion or not, I cannot say. Uh, last time I looked, I'm not a member of the Australian Parliament. Mind you, if we lose the next one, Malcolm and I will join a unity ticket. We'll both come back and do something <laughs> about it. But the bottom line is... Well, you know, the seniors vote is getting more important, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> speak for yourself, Turnbull. Speak for yourself. <laughs> the but the bottom line is, watch this space for the next National Conference of the Labor Party. People okay, have I, I, seen can, can, the I just, can I just say, I think Kevin is being high... He's always been an idealist and aspirational, but... I, I, I look, I, I think it's unlikely that you will see, um, you know, any action against the Murdoch press from the parliament. I think... To, what to be absolutely honest, Malcolm, I'd be delighted to see yeah. uh, from whichever side of... Yeah, uh, no, I know. I know. find the guts to do it. I'd like to see a complete um, revisiting of entire media, media policy, media ownership. Yeah. Uh, the whole digital thing. I mean, it, it, trying to do these things piecemeal is just bullshit. Yeah, I look, I, I think, it, as in many cases, the technology, technological changes have massively overtaken uh, policy, you know, legislators, etc. But I, I, I think the, the, real, the real issue is going to be when advertisers start pulling ads and saying, we do not want to be on this platform. We saw some examples of that with Alan Jones. I mean, that's why Jones is not broadcasting on 2GB, because mm. people didn't want to be associated with his ranting and, you know, hate-filled propaganda. Uh, and I think ultimately that's, you know, that, 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 that's going to be the most, I think, the most effective measure. I think the, in terms of the point Cathy made about uh, truth in advertising, I think there's a, I, th I think really, We've got to go back to that. I, I really do. I mean, my instinct at the time was that it would just be too cumbersome. You know, you'd get into all sorts of arguments about free speech and censorship and so forth. But there is, it's become so egregious. You know, the lies have become so egregious and people have been able to get away with it. And you see, it's the ability to narrow cast lying. It's not just what's on the front page of the Daily Telegraph yeah. or what's on Sky News. It's those direct digital messages being sent to the four or five percent of a critical electorate, which are targeted to deceive them. So, yeah. you know, that's so I think, you know, I, 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 I honestly think we are. And this is partly the fact that, you know, the, the age, even though most of the politicians are younger than me and Kevin, uh, they nonetheless, most of them have not grown up with the digital world and are not, not actually switched on to what is going on. Uh, I want to spend the next three or four minutes talking about the ABC before we come back to the broader picture. But to me, the ABC is a broad part of a broader picture. Cathy McGowan, you, you've heard the observations so far, how important, and you've been part of how important in the context we've talked of everything we've talked about is the ABC and, and is it, how important is it that the ABC is both strongly funded, properly funded, and genuinely independent of the political process. So yes, yes to all that, that conversation. And I don't think we're gonna have any argument about it, but what I really wanna talk about is rural and regional Australia here. Yes. Because um, 
the the ability of the ABC and and SBS, I'm going to say, yes, um, out sort of and, and and Kevin, you're talking about Sky News, so the ABC is our savior, <laughs> you know, because we've still got it in the regions and we've got SBS, and 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 the radio that goes with it. So I think this whole sense of where we're going to go as a nation and and the and my particular bias is where does rural and regional Australia fit in to this nation and it's not just the ABC which I think is really really important it's actually the it's the connectivity that the ABC has with its communities and and certainly in our regional area like Albury Wodonga look a huge shout out to the ABC radio um it's, it's the heart and soul of so much of what goes on. So it, the, the journalists there have a knowledge, a really deep knowledge of our communities. And you bring that together with, we've still got in my, my region, a really strong um, commercial TV, not so much TV, uh, newspaper, locally owned newspapers, locally owned radio. So we still have media in, in the regions that reports for us in Victoria. And the, the Country Press Association. Not Australia. in Queensland, Cathy, but go on. Not in Queensland, no, no. And I got the figures today on how, on how the difference is between the two states. And one of the really significant things is that in Victoria, the Victorian government has been pumping money into regional newspapers and particularly into advertise and radio for advertising around COVID and also around the bushfires. So there's been a lifeline thrown to that regional media. So I, I, I want to say yes to the ABC because it's so important. But I also want to say that the Commonwealth Government has also really strong responsibility to support um, non-monopoly, non the big picture media, so that we actually have competition within the, in the communities that we, we talk to. Yeah. Uh, Malcolm, again, very briefly, um, you heard Kevin talk a moment ago about the need to not just to have long-term funding and, and five-year funding, he said, but to actually lock it in so it is protected. And I want you to explain to me, if you can, why it is that your side of politics has such an obsession to the point of hatred in many cases with the ABC. And I, I'll never forget you coming up to me uh, at a function, an ABC function in Parliament House in Canberra, a few months before you became the communications minister in the new Abbott government. And the first thing you said to me was, the ABC has never been as important as it is today, and yet you were the communications minister who cut hundreds of millions of dollars from it. Yeah, well, uh, and, uh, it wasn't, and you it did wasn't it that knowing, you, and, uh, hang on, and you did it knowing that, uh, that your new prime minister, Tony Abbott, had promised that there would be no cuts to the ABC. Well, what is well, that okay, all well, about? Look, all right, and well, he made that promise to me in a public debate yeah. when he defeated me in 2013. Talk about yeah. truth and advertising. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. But no, well, I, I very strongly believe the ABC is more important than ever. I think one of the reasons our politics is not as catastrophically, you know, broken as that in the United States is because we do have the ABC and SBS. We do have public broadcasters. And I think it's I think they're critically they are more important than ever. Absolutely agree. Uh, look, the at the time the cuts were made uh, when, you know, the Abbott government got in. They, they were not hundreds of millions of dollars, but they were consistent with cuts that were being made right across the board. You know, we were, our approach at the time was to try to get the, the, the budget back into balance. There was a time when that was taken seriously. I remember Kevin, Kevin, you're, you're, Malcolm, you're, you're, Malcolm, you're old enough ABC, to remember that. Yeah, but but that, Kevin, that if the, if Malcolm, if the ABC was as important as you said it was, yeah. Why couldn't it have been quarantined? Why, no, 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 no why but you see, Kerry, Kerry, just, just hear me yeah. out. Just because a, a broadcast, you can have two broadcasters. One has twice the budget of the other, yeah. but the other has a better quality product. So, you know, you, you, the, the real issue, uh, the real issue is not just simply one of dollars. It's not like saying you throw more dollars at the ABC and it'll get better. The critical problem, I think, for the ABC in this environment where, you know, clickbait, you know, the 20, the 60 second news cycle, we used to be a 24 hour news cycle, all of that is, is seeking to infect the ABC. And, and you know, it is the, I, I think the, you know, I'll, I'll tell you the one thing the ABC did not do that I, well, they, a lot of things they didn't do that I encouraged them to do, but one thing they didn't do, which I begged them to do, was to make the position of editor-in-chief 
separate from the managing director. Now, when Mark Scott was the managing director, <clears throat> you could sort of say, oh, well, he's a former newspaper editor and so forth. But I think the ABC needs stronger editorial leadership. You know, it has a statutory obligation to be accurate uh, in reporting the news and impartial in current affairs and, you know, balanced and all yeah. of those things. And that is that like that. I mean, I think, you know, the nine newspapers do their best to maintain that. But Murdoch has thrown that out the window and in Fox with Fox, particularly very successfully from a commercial point of view. So the, the, the challenge for the ABC is, in, is to be able to, in effect, swim against the media zeitgeist of the time and be strictly accurate, balanced and impartial. Now, of course, yeah. that needs money. Yes, yes but, but comrade, it also they needs leadership. That. What? <laughs> Sorry, Kevin. Said, comrade, they need a bit of cash to do that. No, 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 of course they do. I'm not, <laughs> hey, look. Yeah. Hang on, really, hang on, listen. I'm very, really, I'm very, I, I mean, I'm very conscious I, I, of the I have actually, I have restructured television networks. I've had a long history yeah. in the media industry. Yeah. I do know that you can't put on television programs on fresh air. I get that. But what mm -hmm. I'm saying is that the, the, the ABC is more important than ever. But the, one of the critiques of it from the right is not from me, is to say, why are we paying taxes for the ABC to do stuff that you know, the private sector is doing? Well, you know what? Even if that argument was right 20 years ago, it is not right today. Because honestly, the ABC's mission is almost unique. And, and it is, and it is being, these young journalists, and most of them are quite young, are being pulled in the direction of clickbait, opinion, you know, uh, sort of partisanship. And they have to be uh, different. And so it's, partly, so it, it, it's, partly, harder, it's Malcolm, harder to do extent, that job. Malcolm, to the extent that that is true, it, in part at least, it is because the sense of creeping intimidation in the place and fear in the place that if they don't demonstrate their relevance through ratings and followings, yeah. whether it's clickbait or whatever else, then that is grist for the mill of those, including those inside the parliament who are the ABC haters. Okay, well, let, let me frame that problem for you because it's, it, it is Just a quickly, time you've got, you've got Very quickly, you've got, very quickly. 30 seconds. So, so yeah. here's the problem. If the ABC chases ratings, people say, oh, you're just doing what the commercials do and, you know, why should we be subsidising it? If, on the other hand, they publish uh, Sophocles, broadcast Sophocles in the original Greek, people will say this is all very edifying but utterly elitist and nobody's watching it. So it isn't easy. You can't satisfy both arguments. And that's so why the, the ABC is a harder way. business to run yeah. than a commercial broadcaster. Yeah, OK. Look, we, we've got to leave it there because I'm going to give each of you yep. uh, an opportunity for a quick wrap on... on on the key point that you want to be taken out of this discussion. Uh, okay. And then I'll have to hand it back to Cathy. Kevin, yeah. I'll, I'll finish with you, Cathy. Okay, righto. Good, thank you. And thank you, Cathy, for pulling us together. Because what unites, I think, this group and your two or 3,000 people who have joined us is that we sense that something is sick in the democracy. And it's not just an ordinary sickness. It's something which actually needs some quite urgent and radical surgery and which both the political class and the media class actually have mutual responsibility. Second point is in terms of a systemic response, I simply argue this. One, the concentration of media ownership must now change through legislative change. My vehicle, proposed vehicle for doing that is to throw it open through a Royal Commission, which doesn't just look at print media, but frankly, all the other media realities today brought about by the new technologies. The second is in the political class itself, uh, truth and advertising that legislation is critical. Uh, otherwise, uh, truth becomes the absolute casualty and kills democracy. Thirdly, though, to conclude on Auntie and the ABC, um, look, I've been belted around the, the head by the ABC as much as Malcolm has, uh, but I actually uh, uh, think... More, more, I think, Kevin, more. <laughs> I mean, deservedly, but more. The, uh, Malcolm, we've just talked about truth and advertising. That's <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, um, the The third point is this, is that fixing the ABC's future, again, is not rocket science. One, entrench uh, the budget. 
uh, in legislation, which makes it virtually impossible for a future Senate to fiddle with it, given that the independents will always control the Senate. Secondly, uh, in terms of ABC independence, look at a revisitation of the ABC Act. We sought to make, for example, the board of the ABC independent. My government made no quickly, Kevin. Yeah. No, no political appointees. We can entrench that further so you do not have this egregious political, uh, political interference. And thirdly, with those resources, bring back late line, bring back state late line, bring back local authority late line, bring back or well, put on every night 15 minutes of media watch and keep the whole media establishment on their toes against truth of reporting. Okay. Three sets of responses to the problem. Okay, Malcolm, you've got one minute. Well, no, I, I, we're going I, I, I passed the baton or the, 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 the conch off onto Cathy McGowan. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. And I just say, Kevin, thank you so much for that. Uh, that was just a, a lovely summary. Um, but we're not done yet. So the election is 100 days out. So in bringing tonight to, um, to a close, I, I definitely want to thank you for coming and to the audience for their participation. Um, you haven't disappointed us, I have to say, uh, and I, I know there's a lot more you know about the media that we haven't been able to cover, so hopefully there'll be other opportunities. But on behalf of the community independence team, um, what we want from those of us who've been here tonight is to begin the discussion or to continue the discussion, because there is a vital connection between the health of our democracy and our media and our institutions. And it's a conversation that we need to have and we can have in large numbers. So my call is that to let a thousand conversations bloom, but let them bloom with great direction. Let them bloom with people who are of whatever persuasion is running to be your elected representative. You know, are they going to pick up what Kevin says? Are they going to pick up truth in advertising? What are they going to do about the, the massive uh, kilter that we're out of kilter that we're experiencing. So I have those conversations. But what I really want to say is the power of community is exactly as both prime ministers, former prime ministers have said, it's in our, it's in our, uh, our ability to advertise and to impact on advertising. So we need to be giving feedback to the system because the system is designed on, as you're saying, clickbait and, and, and representation is the story landing. And we have just got so much power to influence that. So that's my call out to people tonight is to actually start using our community voice to provide feedback into the system and to the advertisers that we don't like what they're doing and we actually want it to be better. And, and what Kevin has given us is some really clear ways forward. So um, in, in, bringing, in bringing it to a close, um, people have asked, is there a copy of tonight's conversation? Yes, that will go on the CIP webpage. And we've also got transcripts so people can follow it up. But I, but I really do want to acknowledge in, in finishing tonight, um, Kerry, your contribution and, and your passion from the ABC. Um, Kevin, for what you're doing in, in leading the whole argument about getting and the debate about getting our Royal Commission. And, and to Malcolm, I just really want to acknowledge your consistent passion and, and how you keep being in the news talking about all this important business. So I watch the ABC regularly and I see you there articulating what I think is just such great sense. And I wanted to say, can you keep on doing it, please? Because you give so many of us hope that, that we can do better um, and that we've got leadership about doing it better. So on that note, I'll say good night. Uh, thank you all very much for participating and let a thousand conversations bloom about our democracy and about the media's role in it. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks for having us on. Thank Thanks, you. Kerry, for arbitrating the peace. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. And, Thanks Kathy, I think if the election's on May 7, it's 82 days away. Oh, right? that's even worse. That's closer than you think. Yeah, a lot of work to do. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. All the best.